And thanks for joining us for this special Christmas edition of CBN News. I'm Ephraim Graham. The good news this Christmas is for many people, it isn't just a time for gifts under the tree or celebrating the new year. It's a very good time to get into the good book. Paul Strand tells us about the record numbers. Bible reading suddenly spikes around this time of year every year. It doesn't surprise Bobby Grunewald, the pastor behind the popular YouVersion app, where many go these days for the Word of God. It's really natural at Christmas time and New Year's for people to begin to think about God, sometimes for the very first time. All over the world, no matter what translation they're using, more people during this holiday season are picking up the Bible or listening to an audio version of it than during any other time of the year. The folks here at Wycliffe Bible Translators are certainly aware of that as they go about their business of helping to translate the Word into the thousands of native languages that still don't have their own version of the Bible yet. If your uh, audience can think of a, an, a, a world where there is no Bible, and all of a sudden you have that good news. I mean, here we are at Christmas time, we're talking about the Prince of Peace, and it's all about reconciliation and hope, and you've never heard that story in your mother tongue before. It's very, very powerful. And at the headquarters of the YouVersion app in Edmond, Oklahoma, they actually document the annual sudden surge in Bible use among those who do have access already. We'll see as much as a 50% increase in the amount of people that are reading the Bible um, from December to January, just with the influx of the holiday season. People are reading the Christmas story, and many are making New Year's resolutions about getting into the Word or all the way through it. But sadly, it seems almost as many people break as make those resolutions. A lot of times when they get into to February, uh, middle of February, it begins, if they haven't really formed a really solid habit, it really does become, begin to drop off. Grunewald says, though, if you'll stick with the word, it'll pay not just good, but divine dividends. I believe that the Bible is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And so if we engage daily with God's word, it's a way for him to illuminate his direction in our lives. And who doesn't need that? Paul Strand, CBN News. And during the Christmas season, many Christians make a pilgrimage to Bethlehem to the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Most visit the Church in the Nativity, the traditional site of Jesus' birth. But after 2,000 years, do people really know where Jesus was born? Our Chris Mitchell reports now from Bethlehem. It's one of the oldest churches in the world, the Church of the Nativity. This is the place where Jesus Christ was born. Professor Kastandi Shamali teaches history at Bethlehem University and is an expert on the Church of the Nativity. The Church of Nativity was built over this place in 326 when Emperor Constantine decided to declare Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Inside the church, the original columns from the 4th century still stand. We do know that the identification of the site of where Jesus was born already traditionally goes back to the middle of the first century uh, AD at least. In the first century, the Roman Emperor Hadrian destroyed the town of Bethlehem. After he destroyed the town, Hadrian built a temple and planted a grove of trees over the site where Christian pilgrims had come to honor the place where Jesus was born. In fact, this temple, instead of uh, uh, destroying the place, preserved the place. Jerome wrote in 396 AD, even amongst those who are strangers to the faith, it is known that inside that grotto, he who is adored and glorified by the Christians was born. This is the main entrance into the Church of the Nativity. It's called the Door of Humility because you have to bend down in order to get inside the church. It was originally built by the Crusaders and then altered by the Ottomans in order to keep mounted horsemen out of the church. 1,400 years after Queen Helena built the church, Christian pilgrims still come from around the world. The central place lays inside the grotto. Many believe it's the very cave where Jesus was born. A star marks the exact location. Many crowd down the narrow stairs to get inside the cave. Down below, pilgrims often touch the star and record the moment they got to see the birthplace of Jesus. For many, it's a profound emotional and spiritual experience. What did it mean to be at the birthplace of Jesus? Uh, something I cannot describe. I mean, everything makes sense and no words. I mean, it's difficult. I'm really surprised. Now when I open my Bible, as I do each morning when I'm here and I'm reading, uh, it's... Well, now I can picture the places. It's just unbelievable. It's a live stream. Never expected to be here, but it's just awesome. Father Peter Vasco leads pilgrims to Bethlehem. 
He says it's especially meaningful during the Christmas season. I think it's an absolute wonderful occasion for pilgrims to come, especially so close to Christmas, uh, to be here to pray at, at the spot where Jesus was born and to bring that prayer back in their own lives. But another event recorded in the Bible took place after Jesus was born. Professor Shamali gave us a rare look underneath the Church of the Nativity. Yes. This is the place where we have the tomb of the innocent children. Mm -hmm. Herod killed around 6,000 children from the whole area in order to kill Jesus Christ. We followed Professor Shamali down to some of the tombs below the church. Here are the tombs of the innocent children. These are the bones of some of the children that we believe were killed by Herod. Another significant event took place just outside Bethlehem. Pastor Steve Corey showed us caves many believe were used by the shepherds on that holy night. According to history, shepherds would use these caves to store the sheep during the winter, uh, to store their food in the, in the caves, and also uh, places to live uh, with them. You know, the, the shepherds were very close to their sheep. Those shepherds became the first witnesses to the fulfillment of a prophecy given 700 years before when Isaiah proclaimed, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Today, that Christmas message is still the same for pilgrims, professors, and pastors. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Bethlehem. And we'll be right back with more of this Christmas program, including seeing biblical principles being played out on the big screen. The Battle of the Five Armies hit theaters last week, and fans of The Hobbit will head to Middle Earth one last time. That's the world created by the legendary author and Oxford professor J.R.R. Tolkien. His works, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, are the second and third most read novels of all time. As Paul Strand reports, these great reads are loaded with Christian wisdom. Three. As The Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies hits theaters, it ends an entertainment series that was decades in the making. But a new book, The Hobbit Party, points out that entertainment is just a part of these Middle Earth movies and the J.R.R. Tolkien books they're based on. Tolkien had more to offer than just a, a really good yarn. According to co-author Jay Richards, they also portray an entire universe of moral, government, and economic systems. That's why it's subtitled, The Vision of Freedom That Tolkien Got and the West Forgot. The evil power craze Sauron came out of Tolkien's experience of witnessing the brutalities of fascism and Nazism in World War II and the communist cruelty that followed. There's a theme throughout The Lord of the Rings of a concern for the centralization of power. I mean, the ring itself, the ring of power that the good guys spend the entire story trying to get rid of, not trying to gain, this, this power to dominate the will of others. While World War I vet Tolkien hated the senseless slaughter of war, he loved liberty even more. So his heroes constantly fought for it in The Lord of the Rings. A day may come when the courage of men fails. The good guys in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, they recognize that sometimes you need to fight, you need to be willing to die. And the cause in every case uh, that they're willing to die for is freedom. Tolkien said he was a hobbit in all but height, and the Shire where hobbits lived reflected not only his idyllic childhood hometown, but the way he thought society should run, a place of almost no laws and only a tiny bit of government. He admitted to his son he leaned towards anarchy and hated the idea of people lording it over other people. Tolkien said famously, it is the most improper job of any man to boss others, least of all those who seek the opportunity. Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings as he watched Britain slide into a soft socialism. He was horrified the citizens of the Christian nations would give up their God-given liberty in exchange for security offered by all-powerful governments. Would essentially be docile sheep guided by the shepherd. He was hopeful art like his could shake them up and wake them up. As for economics, hippies dug The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings because they saw Tolkien as a cool anti-capitalist and that creating creatures like the aristocratic Smaug was his way to show it. But Richard says Tolkien used the character to illustrate the absolute worst traits of a wealthy, non-investing, non-capitalist. There you are, thief in the shadows. 
who sits atop a, literally a pile of gold that belongs to other people. This is not a critique of the capitalist or the entrepreneur. This is the critique of the miser who hoards his wealth rather than putting at risk. That, that's what enterprise is about. Tolkien portrayed prosperous worlds of robust capitalism and free trade at the end of both books. A widening trade, uh, not just between different you know, sort of human populations or different cities, but actually interspecies trade between hobbits and dwarves and elves and men. Gardener Sam personifies the world working at its best as he creates wealth with his hands and the future with his wife. Puts together both our economic activity as creatures made as stewards in the image of God, to steward and to till and to keep the garden, and also to multiply, to have children. The deeply Christian Tolkien intentionally used humble hobbits as heroes, a way to show that even the least of us deeply matters and can change our world for the better. It only occurred to someone who had this vision that the creator of the universe could become incarnate as a man born of a woman in a stable in a humble village. It's only that kind of vision that I would think would, would lead someone to think to create heroes like hobbits. I can't carry it for you. But I can carry you! Near the climax of Lord of the Rings, it's the humble servant Sam who literally bears Frodo like a cross and saves the world. And I hope that that speaks to us as human beings, especially those of us that might think, well, well who am I? Uh, what important position am I playing? Well, take some inspiration from Frodo and from Sam. Orphan Annie is back, this time in theaters, and it opened nationwide this past weekend. The Hollywood heavyweight behind this film is the same preacher and film executive who helped to green light Heaven is for Real earlier this year. I sat down with Devon Franklin just a few days ago to talk about this latest work of inspiration. America's favorite orphan, Annie, has been a cartoon, two films, and a Broadway show. And now it is in theaters again, starring Academy Award-winning actor Jamie Foxx and young actress Quivangene Wallace, who was nominated for an Oscar for her performance in Beast of the Southern Wild back in 2012, the youngest nominee in history. Put your bag down. You're not going anywhere. Sandy's got to go. Stop it. You and Sandy are staying here, and I don't care what happened last night. No, I mean Sandy's gotta go. No, I mean, oh, Sandy's gotta go. Okay, well, is it, uh, is it champagne or gelato? What? Is it Mountain Dew or is it just plain old dew? Is it lemonade or chicken nuggets? We should, I should go. Now I wanna go because my <laughs> bladder's full. Come on, let's go. Behind the scenes of this project are actor Will Smith, rapper Jay-Z, and preacher and film executive Devon Franklin. Annie, why do that film again? It's a process that's taken years, um, and it's a process that's kind of evolved organically. Um, but you know, God's timing is always perfect. Absolutely. So I think that it, this movie coming out right now, um, we couldn't have chosen a better time for this film to come to the world. Franklin is a Hollywood champion of inspirational entertainment and recently started his own production company to bring more of it to the small and big screen. So after seeing Annie, how do I leave the film feeling better? All that's going on in the world, you know, and I think that every time you turn on the news, there's always some new tragedy or some, you know, new tribulation or trial that uh, we have to endure. And I think a movie like Annie, you know, really is a celebration of family. It's a celebration of hope. It's a celebration of optimism. It's a celebration of faith. And I think that we need to, you know, especially during times that we perceive as really dark times, you know, we need hope. And I think movies like this, where you can take your whole family to it and enjoy it and sing and, and laugh and cry, I think this is really important to kind of keep our spirits up and to keep our, our minds and, and hearts focused on, you know, even though we may be in a dark day at times, you know, the light is there. And up next, the story of a favorite Christmas song that doesn't even have its roots in the holiday. It is one of the most endearing Christmas carols, one that, believe it or not, isn't even a Christmas song. Here's the history and meaning behind O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel is really a beloved hymn, and most people don't realize that this hymn was composed to be an Advent song, not a Christmas carol at all. Each one is based on one of the titles of the Messiah that is found in the Old Testament. O come, O come, Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel. 
Emmanuel, of course, is the title given to the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 7, where Isaiah prophesies that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and will call his name Emmanuel. The Gospel of Matthew applies this very scripture to Jesus at his birth. Another one of the titles applied to the Messiah that was adapted into the song is the Rod of Jesse. O come thou Rod of Jesse, come. The Rod of Jesse is referred to in Isaiah chapter 11. And the Rod of Jesse refers, of course, to the kingship, to the ruling. Jesse was the father of David. And so when we sing of the Rod of, of Jesse, we're singing of the descendant of David, the Messiah, Jesus. One of the verses calls for the day spring from on high to arise. O come thou day spring, come and cheer our hearts. The day spring refers to Malachi chapter four, where we read that the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. This verse does not refer as much to the kingship of the Messiah, but it refers to his tenderness, to his personalness, to his compassion for those who are weary, for those who suffer and toil, for those who are ill, crying out that the day spring, the Son of Righteousness will come with healing, not only for our bodies, but for our hearts, our souls, and our spirits. Many of the titles that are used in the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, come from the book of Isaiah. Another one is the key of David. O come thou key of David, come and open up the way to our heavenly home. The key of David comes from Isaiah 22, and it speaks of, of that opening to passage, to freedom of access that is echoed in the book of Revelation, when Jesus in the book of Revelation gives the key of David, which opens doors that no man can shut. Another very beautiful theme that is touched on in the hymn is when they refer to the Messiah as the Lord of Might. The Lord of Might, of course, comes from Isaiah when it speaks in Isaiah chapter 11 that upon him will rest the spirit of counsel and wisdom and might and understanding. But the hymn reflects on the Lord of Might as being the one who gives the word of the Lord. On Sinai's height gave the law. And of course, the word of the Lord is not simply the law, but it's really Jesus himself. Jesus is the word of God. The song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is evoking that longing and expectation that we have. We celebrate that Jesus has already come, but we know that something is not yet complete. So it's a very beautiful song because it, it has an echo of the past, but a tremendous anticipation of that glorious coming when the rod of Jesse, the key of David, the one who is almighty, God with us, will establish his kingdom on earth. I like to think of Emmanuel, God with me today, God perfectly present, God who brings his salvation at this moment, God who became Jesus, who showed his love for us in laying down his life, who calls me by name, who calls each of us by name, who loves us as a father, who loves us as a shepherd, who loves us as a king. Today he cries out for the salvation of each human being. Today is the day of salvation. We don't have to wait till tomorrow. We can celebrate Emmanuel, God with us today. The birth of Jesus was remembered in a very live way in the nation's capital recently. The Christian outreach group Faith in Action performed a live nativity processional through the streets near the Supreme Court to the Capitol. Organizers say it's a beautiful way to remember the miracle God gave us through Christ. Oh come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. I think it's important to share this incredible message of Christmas. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The birth of Christ bringing hope and joy to the world. 
If there's ever a time we needed that message of Jesus, it's now. The courts uh, tragically have said that putting a manger scene up or a nativity display is a violation of the Establishment Clause. We don't agree with that at all. But we have found a creative way to address that, and it's this. Individuals and church groups can go get permits and display the nativity and mangers themselves. If we can display the message of Christmas, the birth of Christ, the nativity displays in front of the most powerful court in America, then every person, every citizen has the right to display these nativity scenes across America. We enjoy a right in this country, an acknowledged and legally protected right to express this belief, to express this beautiful story in a public arena. It's just <coughs> awesome that they can do this in the public and uh, just kind of get the message out there to those that maybe don't know the full message or um, you know maybe just never heard of it or have a different belief. The message of Christmas unifies people. It doesn't, it doesn't divide people. So it's a wonderful way to share the gospel visually and to be brought back and to see and to remember God's extraordinary love for us. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward them. And that's all for now. From all of us here at CBN News, Merry Christmas and may the miracle of Christ's birth bring you great joy this season.